Continuing with our Science Cafe series, Mysteries Revealed, Discoveries in Chemistry. If you're new to the series, welcome. If you are interested in viewing previous presenters, I do have all of that uploaded on our College of Science website. Desert View Performing Arts Center also has it on their YouTube page and they do live stream it. So feel free to review. And then we have a few other College of Science, Science Cafe venues, Tumamak Hill, Borderland Brewings, Magpies, and our newest Tucson Botanical Gardens, all of which are recorded or live streamed on Facebook, and then they're all up on our website as well. So if you're interested in viewing other uh, outreach venue science cafes, we have those on our College of Science website. And mm, just a reminder of our format tonight, we will have our presenter come up. From there, I will do about 15 minutes of Q&A and then no, kind of wrap it up from there. He has made himself available if you do have any questions after the talk and we will take it from there. I will introduce our speaker in a moment and I don't have much for you guys tonight. So there's not too many, it's the holidays, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then just last little thing, we do have our evaluations out front. That does help us better facilitate these talks, speak to topics that you're interested in. And then it does give the, the presenter feedback that just helps with the overall professional development for our office and then what we're trying to do with the science outreach. And I'll introduce our speaker now. So tonight's presentation three, is going to focus on 3D drug design and presenting is Dr. Wolfgang Petty. Dr. Wolfgang Petty, professor of chemistry and biochemistry, is the Homer C. Emily Davis Weed Endowed Chair at the University of Arizona. Dr. Petty received his undergraduate degree from the University of Vienna in Austria and his PhD degree from the University of Frankfurt, Germany. His doctoral research focused on the development of novel methods for biomolecular NMR spectroscopy for the detection of protein dynamics that are essential for the biological functions. Dr. Petty joined the University of Arizona in 2017. His scientific interests are the interface of chemistry and biochemistry, especially in drugging previously undruggable protein targets. He is the inaugural recipient of the, Air, the American Diabetes Association Pathway to Cure grant. And Dr. Petty is the associate editor for the protein structure, structure and folding of the Journal of Biochemistry. Tonight, he will discuss how we use structure to design drugs. Will you please help me in welcoming Dr. Wolfgang Petty. Thank you. Can you hear? Yeah, perfect. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I know Saddlebrook very well. I, you usually see me in slightly different dress when I'm on my bikes. Uh, <laughs> going around in the neighborhood, that's my, that's my way of getting relaxation over. But really what I'm working on is uh, partially what I will show you today. I joined uh, Arizona about two years ago. Said. I was for about 15 years, Professor Brown University before that, changing basically coasts uh, <clears throat> a little bit. And my wife is from Arizona, so I re she really enjoyed being here. And so do I. So thanks again for having me. And I changed the title slightly. And please feel free to interrupt me at any point. I think we're, it, it looks big, but we're all familiar with each other. So it's proteins, magnets, and x-rays, drug development in 21st century. So I want to tell you a little bit something. I, what we have to do is we have to understand a couple of things, how we do drug design, and not just at the University of Arizona, but how is it done at a, in a modern setting? And why can we do it in a certain way? So I will tell you a little bit something about proteins. These are these basic building blocks that make us work, make us function, may allow us to communicate, make us do basically everything that we are doing. And then I'll tell you how we use the shape of these molecules that describe the function to really design modern drugs. And I give you a couple of ways how we can do that in an outlook at the end. So we'll see how far we can go and I give you an idea. So the, the key part that I want to drive home is actually this is what science does for us. This is really what science does for us in the 1900s or about 120 years ago, the average life expectancy was 47 years, okay? In the 2000s, it's 76 years. 
So why did we go from 50 to 76 years? Well, one reason is we have fresh water, okay? Fresh water, access to fresh sanitized water is a big reason why it is, okay? In the clear case, we have healthcare, okay? We have developed healthcare and that's a big part of it. And what helps healthcare is medicine, okay? Here I show you a couple of medicines that we all know. I think we all know this thing here, aspirin. Okay, this is the original way how it was sold in 250 grams. We take a little bit less these days in these little tablets, and they help quite a bit. We know about penicillin. That's really a changer. That's one of the reasons we went from 50 to 75 years, because we can fight bacterial infections. Insulin, type 1, type 2 diabetes. Insulin is a really a game changer that allows us to live a fairly normal life, despite of the fact that uh, it, 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 uh, we, we have a disease. And there's a, there's a couple of other drugs that we will always come back during the talk. What they're all doing is they are working in changing the abilities of these proteins to work, okay? These medicines work on these targets. And what I will do today is help you to connect what these things are that I show you here. I hope you like them as well as I do because I think they have spectacular folds. And it's these folds, the shape of these proteins that allow them to function, okay? And we need to understand how this shape allows them to function. And then we can use it as a blueprint. And we use it as a blueprint. So when we know what one thing looks like, we can design now a second thing that directly interacts with it. It's very easy when you have a 3D picture of it in front of you. And in German, my mother tongue, but the, when you see something, you understand something. It's the same word, begreifen. Okay? So if you see something, you understand something. And that's really what we are doing. When we're solving and determining the structures here, we see it, we understand how it functions, and we can use that information to design the drugs here. So proteins, what are they? They help us in every stage. They're really the work of molecules in our body. Think about it this way. Any things that we do, they make up our brains, there are receptors that allow us to smell, to taste, to do everything. They allow us to move oxygen in the blood. They are enzymes that all of the metabolic pathways are controlled by them. Our hairs, our nails are made out of enzymes. Antibodies that react to uh, our immune system, those are proteins, and muscles are proteins. Um, we don't look like a protein. We also don't look like Homer Simpson, luckily, but we don't look like proteins uh, for the reasons that we need to look at the size that we are talking about here. Okay, so let me give you an example. That's a, a person, it's about half a meter here. It's about this size here. Let's look at the muscle. Okay, that's a muscle. So I take out the muscle out of the person and I take it apart. You can see, well, there's this capillaries, the blood capillaries that are allowed to have oxygen delivered to it. There is uh, other parts of it, microfibers. And there's like where we come a little bit more to the, uh, the part that allows for action to be happening. Why I can do that is actually that there are different bands out of made different proteins that can shift against each other and allow for these motions to happen. Okay. So this is how it looks. This protein here is called actin, and it's in filament here. That's why it's called F-actin. So the scale that I look from here to here is quite a dramatic change. We go from a half a meter to one, two, three, four, five, six after the decimal. So it's a million, three millions of a meter that you see here. Okay, that's very tiny, but it's still large. Because I can zoom in here to this part of F-actin here and show it here, we have to go much, much smaller. And then I can zoom in here to this part here, which is a single protein here, and that's the size that I'm talking about. That's the size that we have to be able to analyze, look at, and make sense out of it. This is nanometers, 10 to minus 9, 10 to minus 10 meters, okay, that we look at. No eye can see that. It's much, much smaller than any wavelength of visible lights. That's why visible lights has no chance of actually allowing us to look at it. And we'll tell you today what we are using and what, what everybody's using to look at these type of things. And we need to look at those type of things, these enzymes specifically here, to understand how we can sign better drugs that help us 
to actually go from 76 years to 85 or 90 or even longer years, and most importantly, make those years count, make them actually enjoyable to cure the diseases that we have and occurring in those. So what we have here is, what are the proteins made up from? They're made up from 20 small building blocks, and we call them amino acids, okay? Those are 20 amino acids. That's the creativity that we have. Throw them together in a way forward and backwards. They look all very similar, these amino acids. They have an acidic group here and an amino group. That's why they're called amino acids. And they have what we call an R group here. And there's 20 different of these R groups here. And those are the groups that allow to make chemistry happen. Okay, we're nothing else than a chemistry experiment that we're walking around here. That's why we can move, that's why we can live. And it's because of these groups here that allow us to make those chemistry happen. And these are, I show you that in a linear change here, but in reality, it's not a linear chain here. They fold up in a very specific fold. Okay, and we call that everything is folded in a folding pro pro uh, problem. In 1972, Christian Anfinsen became the Nobel Prize because he realized that this is what is happening here, okay? And why is that so important? Because the fold of a protein defines its function, okay? As long as we know the fold here, we realize we can define its function, and as long as we know the function, we can do something against it. So foreign false function, well, that's a logical thing because that's what's happened in the macroscopic life too. This is a chair. It has a specific function, okay? We know when we look at the form of this chair, we understand what its function is. We understand when we look at the shape of a hammer, what its function is, okay? That's a logical thing. So when we look at our proteins now, we understand how they're functioning. It's nothing else. If we look at macroscopic things or microscopic things, they are basically the same. We can understand that. So how does this help us now to make better drugs and allow us to do them? Well, we, we were quite successful. Uh, <laughs> I have. Good. These proteins <clears throat> that we show here, that I just talked to you about to you, have specific functions. And we know what the functions are they're related is and how to help us to do it. I just leave it on this slide and <laughs> we find a ways around it. Because what I want to tell you is actually that this is the protein. If you ever wanted to know how the target of aspirin looks, this is the protein. Okay. The protein of aspirin is called COX-1 and COX-2. And when aspirin, this small molecules, when you take that little pill, that's what's in it. This is the thing that actually functions. Okay, this is the chemistry that happens. And it allows for an acetylation uh, process that modifies one of these amino acids that are part of this enzyme. It's, called, it's a serine residue that has an OH group here that we can now modify. We can transfer this part of this molecule, aspirin, over to this enzyme. And what it does is it completely deactivates and, or changes the abilities of these proteins to work. This is what drugs are doing, and that leads to a specific outcome, and it's an outcome that we desire because we want to have reduced inflammation, we want to have reduced fever, reduced pain, and reduced platelet aggregation, and that's what aspirin is known for. 
Okay, so we know the chemistry that aspirin is doing. We know how is it doing it, despite the fact that Bayer, they didn't know at all what it was doing. They just found it by accident. But we know what it's doing, and it's working specifically on these proteins here. And that's true for all of these proteins here. I can show you all these chemical structures of, this is the chemical structure of penicillin. That looks like uh, uh, that's what's blocking uh, the enzyme that is necessary. Insulin is a peptide. It's not a small chemical compound. It's a peptide, a hormone that is actually binding the insulin receptor. And we know the structure when we do that as well. Or we can use um, <clears throat> uh, vaccines uh, that we have here. So this is a picture of a vaccine that was developed here and that we use successfully as drugs. So this is what we know. We know our chemical compounds that specifically work on these outcomes here. So we can, how can we make these medicines better? How can we design new or better drugs to actually get better outcomes for medical, uh, for our future? Well, what we can do is we can make drugs that bind these protein targets that we know are helpful much tighter. What does it do? They have less side effects. Okay, that's a good thing. We want less side effects. Or we can, this further decreases cross reactions with other proteins. So we can, or we can find different ways or more efficient ways to make compounds that have the same outcome, but they can be easier or cheaper to synthesize and allows us to bring down the cost of these drugs as well. But to do that, we need to determine the structures of the proteins that are 10 million times smaller than my hand. Okay, I have 10 million proteins I can hold in one hand easily and more, and I need to determine the structures. So this is how we do that. We use either extra crystallography and NMR spectroscopy, and I will use a few minutes to show you how we are actually doing that. Okay, so this is what it's an, an, an in-house extra crystallography instrument looks like. This is what an NMR spectrometer looks like. And when we do that, it's, it's an interesting thing. We all know crystals, okay? Best knows of all of us, uh, uh, probably some of you escaped uh, the Northeast or the Midwest where it's very cold because there's a lot of snow and water can crystallize. We know that it's snow and ice, okay? Proteins can crystallize too. Proteins, crystals indeed have a lot of water, okay? These proteins crystallize and what it is, it goes from a liquid state in an ordered state. That's everything that a crystal is. It goes from a liquid state which has a lot of degrees of freedom into an ordered state, okay, which has organization. And that's what it is. So it's a crystal like an ice crystal or a crystal of a protein crystal. They are basically the same. And what we can do is we can actually shine light on it. And it depends on the energy that we use, what the outcome is of the light. And what we can is get a diffraction pattern, okay? When you shine light on ice, you get a diffraction pattern, okay? Um, and when we use that diffraction pattern, we can use that using some math and some other information to get something, an electron density map, which tells us exactly where the electrons are, and that we can use to get an atomic model of the, uh, of the protein. So I told you we need to use X-rays, and I have to tell you why we use X-rays, okay? We need a very power, this, these are very powerful, uh, it's very powerful light, if you want so. This is our electromagnetic spectrum. This is where our visible light sits, okay? That's the light that we use here, okay? And we know that the visible light has different colors here, and we can define the colors based on the wavelengths. But the wavelengths also tell us how energy rich that light is. Okay, so, and William Röntgen was the first one to actually identify X-rays, okay? It's the same Röntgen that we, is known for, uh, for X-ray, for the, for the work in the hospital here that we have here. And the X-rays here, they have a much, much tighter wavelength. They're about one nanometer. Our light that we use here to light the auditorium here, to light the projector here, which uses about 500, 600 nanometers wavelength. Okay, the shorter that number, the high energy. So why are we using X-rays? Well, a bond length in a protein is about the length of an X-ray here. So we need to match our light to see what we want to actually detect. So it's a matching effect that we have to use here. Okay, fine, that makes sense. 
So how, why do we you have to use crystals? Why don't I shine it just on a liquid that I have standing around here? Well, light can be just po quite powerful, as we know that. If we are sitting in the summer too long outside here, what we get is a sunburn, okay? Uh, and we know what can we do to get protected against the powerful light? Well, we can either protect ourselves with different materials that don't allow the light to go through, okay? Or put sunscreen on, that's, uh, uh, that's, those are the two ways. And this is quite powerful light. What is happening now if I would use an X-ray power to put it on a person, okay? That's when that's how powerful extra light is. If extra shines directly on on human skin or flash, that's what's happening with human skin and flash. So in in reality, when we had right now these first equipments built up to see all the time if the extras are on, they were using the fingers. They had all lost their fingers at the end when they were working. So it's very typical for physicists to have like. Uh, no fingers at the end of their career because they tested for x-rays, they tested for other things. Uh, and so that's the way it was. Luckily, we don't test like this anymore. We have sensors that tell us if the x-ray is on or not. So that has become a little bit more uh, easy. The working environments have become better. And so what would happen if I now shoot this powerful x-ray that destroyed all the skin here in a very short time on my protein here? Okay, it's too much energy for that little guy. It cannot handle it. So what, that's why we have to form a crystal because crystals is nothing else than I order millions and millions and millions of those guys. So while a few die along the way, I have enough to get that information. Okay, a crystal, and there, I think they're quite pretty pictures. When you get these protein crystals, huh? you get billions and billions of these proteins within this crystal here. And so you have a lot of these to go, die along the way, but you have enough to fulfill your experiment that you want to do is. And these crystals, when we do them in a laboratory setting, we, we shrink them. Everything is becoming smaller and smaller, so we can do it at higher throughput. Okay, we, these setups, we, we make thousands and thousands of these setups. Luckily, we don't do it by hand. We have a robot that does it for us. But the size is spectacular, and that happened, that development happened over the last about 20 years, driven by NIH money. This was really done when NIH had the idea we need to automate that and put that forward. It was not the companies, it was NIH, and we all started to build those machines and to be able to allow us this. So this is the penny here, and this is the size of one experiment that we are doing. We're going down to 40 nanoliters, so no eye can see that. I have to go with a microscope here to show you that, and that's the size of our experiments. That's the size of these crystals that we use for this, so to give you a feeling of how small of a size that is and we can do. And these crystals can come in all types of shapes is here. And we have just built up one of these systems here over the last two years at the University of Arizona too, that allows us to use those crystals here. We can also go to synchrotrons, okay? These are national facilities that are supported nationally for us researchers to go there. Most of the work that is done there is actually engineering work, it's materials work, to how to get better materials. That's really critical to have those synchrotrons, but we uh, also use them here to get these high-powered x-rays to actually determine the structures here. There are New York, uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory in Long Island is a famous one. APS in Chicago is a famous one. Uh, there's one in Stanford that is a famous one. So they're all around the U.S. that we can use and collect the data. So we get the data, we can calculate, and that allows us to get the structures of the things. NMR spectroscopy is another technique that we can use. And NMR stays for nuclear magnetic resonance. So you might say, well, th 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 this is something all of you have, well, I, I don't hope all of you had, but there's a good chance that all of you have done NMR spectroscopy, likely on yourself. Who has had an MRI? That's the cousin. In a hospital setting, we took out the nuclear. Nuclear doesn't sound so good, so magnetic resonance imaging sounds a little bit better. There's less fear. So we take out the nuclear, but the magnetic resonance is actually still in there. Okay? So what we're doing here, this is a large superconductive magnets that we're using for doing that here. This is big. This is about um, 20 Tesla. 
that's the size of this magnet in the hospital setting, we have one or three Tesla. They are much, much smaller uh, magnets here. And what we're doing here is actually we can take our proteins into this NMR spectroscopy, it was spectrometer, again, record the data necessary to determine these structures here. And there's a big difference. We don't rely on crystals. We can do it in solution. So if your protein doesn't crystallize, we can do it this way. If your protein crystals, you can do it another way. And there's a very symbiotic relationship between these techniques that allows to move forward here. So what we are actually really doing is this is a large magnet. This is really nothing else than a large magnet. Only that it's about 400, 500, 600,000 times the Earth magnetic field. So a little bit stronger than the Earth magnetic field here, what we're having here. And we are putting our protein in here, and what we are doing is NMR spectroscopy is using the nuclear spin to actually determine the information that we need. So I'm by training an NMR spectroscopist, and this is pure quantum mechanics. My wife is a crystallographer, okay? This is classical mechanics. So we have a constant fight, which one is the more elegant technique, and that will probably go on for the rest of our lives. So this is important, but um, I, I, both techniques are important. So this is a sequence, and we can understand how the sequence folds using these parameters here and get to the same information, the same structures. So if you determine the structures of two or three techniques, they will always come to the same result other if there are some differences based on the crystallization conditions that we have. So these are leading us to the same information. So this is the way how we can get those pictures going, how we can get the model that is necessary actually to move forward with our drug designs. So let me tell you what that is actually doing, how we can do that, and what is a good example to better understand that. Okay, so what structure-based drug design is, is we, as I said before, we're using the atomic resolution structure that we determined just together here of a protein enzyme to rationally design new drugs to inhibit its activity. And that's a big difference. For 100 years, what we did is we did trial and error. We relied on luck to find drugs. That is probably not the smartest way of doing it or the most efficient way. Okay, that's a really a drawback. Now we can use rational design. And if you do the rational design, things should become faster, should become smarter, and has less byproduct. And that's exactly what it is. And I'll give you an example here. I'll give you an example. So this is a very old example, but I think from my point of view, is a, it's, it's, it, it's, if, if you think about this, this is actually really fantastic when you think what science can do. Okay? So this is when AIDS, the AIDS epidemic started in the late 80s. Okay? This, the death rate for thousands of, hundred thousands of population was skyrocketing. It was crazy, okay? When you look at that number, it's like unbelievable if you see that. I mean, we have constant death, and actually when I would take that out now, actually to 2018, the incredible thing is that for, um, for unintentional injury, that went down because that's mostly car-related thing. Cars became much safer, and, and we have less crashes of airplanes. Uh, we also have uh, heart disease, and, and all other diseases went down here. So we make progress in deaths. But how can you get such a step function? I mean, this is fantastic, such a step function. If you think about it, how many lives are saved here every year? This is, this is a dramatic effect. So what, we, what, what happened there is very easily. Well, we understand HIV is a, is a virus. So people started to study the virus, very basic. They started to think, how is that thing working? Okay, well, it works very similar. This is again our protein. We're now all experts already here. This is the linear chain, that's the folded chain. That's how it's functioning. And a virus functions slightly different than us. We express each of our 20,000, 25,000 proteins that make us up and make us function in individual chains. Viruses are in somewhat a little bit lazy. They are expressing a very, very long chain because they hitchhack our system to do that. So instead of doing that over and over, they just want to do it once and do it very efficient because they realize they're probably not really welcome of doing that. So rather they don't take that risk. And so they have now this long chain expressed here. And what you can see here really, that's likely not working. It's not function because they don't, cannot adopt the fold that they usually need to adopt the fold, and that's the necessary start to work. So 
what's happening here is we have what's called an enzyme that's a protease. And the name of that enzyme, protease, allows proteins to be cut. Okay, that's what it does. It can cut at specific recognition sites. So this protein can cut now at specific sites. And then I have again my regular proteins that are necessary to make more of my HIV virus. And that's how HIV becomes bigger and bigger and more important. And that's actually how we get infected. Okay, so that's the idea. So if I can form an inhibitor that works against these proteases here, but the outcome is we don't have any proteins anymore and HRV cannot replicate and we are done. Well, it's an easy thought to do that, but that's exactly what people did. They solved the structure in the late 80s to solve the structure of this protease from HIV. And then they used this to design small molecules that perfectly fit into that active site, inhibits the protein. And that's exactly what the HIV, uh, so in 1988, this structure was determined. And they started to design these potent inhibitors. Two years later, they had it. The FDA helped. And already in 95, 96, the first three protease, in here, uh, protease inhibitor for HIV. Can anybody remember where we dropped? 95, 96, 98. That's exactly the time where this, this error dropped. So these are these drugs that really did that dramatic change here. And it, uh, it's these drugs were not healing everybody. And it wasn't really the magic bullet. They worked fantastically for... 70, 80%, but nowadays we still use those drugs in combination with other drugs that actually make the virus work slower, that slow everything down. So we don't only slow down one part of the virus, we slow down multiple parts of the virus these days. And that's why you use this combination here. And that's why we can have that. Those are these drugs that we're talking about. Even, but this idea to block the virus as such was taken over from many other things. Who's taking Tamiflu? Okay. Your protease was inhibited, by the way. <laughs> so that's why, that's why this thing works so quickly. Okay, because you kill the, the ability to cut it apart, it cannot replicate and it's done. So if your Tamiflu, in, especially in the first year when we hit the virus very hard on this thing, it was perfect. You took that pill and then two days later, you were feeling like a newborn person instead of having a flu over multiple weeks. Now it becomes a little bit slower because there is, uh, um, these, these viruses are able to adapt to the medicine. So we need to update these medicines on a constant basis here. And this is now what we're doing for a, a plethora of, 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 of problems in medicine. We use structure-based drug design. So if you have taken modern cancer drugs, everything that adds with an IB, and I hope nobody has to take those, but everything that take, ends on an IB, that's a cancer drug against the kinase, and most of the 90% of them were based on structure-based structure design. Structure okay, that's a really the ones that are really helping and working on that. And um, to give you a flavor, what we have done in, in my lab a couple of years ago, and i just give you an example how we can use that, how we can use that technology to actually understand how these, how we can derive the idea, how we can design a new way of a medicine, how we can improve medicine using it, these pictures that we have here. So my lab is known for working on, on uh, modifications of proteins. So one of the important things is how we are functioning is we get inputs and these inputs need to be correctly communicated. Okay, that's critical. We, and, and this might be a negative input like a bacteria or anything else that we need to take care of or a positive input. We need to work on this input. And what in, in, in medicine or in biology, what's that called? It's signaling. Okay, signaling allows us to communicate throughout the cell. And what I'm working on an enzyme that are critical signaling enzymes. They're allowed for communications. Those are basically your, your cell phones of the cells, okay, that we use to communicate. And when we have a drug, we cut the line of a phone. That's basically the idea. This is harder and harder to tell because fewer and fewer people remember the lines on the phones. But I hope uh, that it's still 
so it, it's still working. So in 10 years, I have a bigger problem. But this is really what we're doing. And a lot of these if tracks that I just told you about against cancer, they work on these kinases. And kinases are capable of modifying these three amino acids that I, some of these I've mentioned before, serine, threonine, and tyrosine. And they can modify it by adding this phosphate group to it. Okay, so then it just looks a little bit different. It's actually a little bit different charge, and that completely allows it to speak with something else. Okay, it's just a way what I can communicate with, or what's the mood actually of the protein, if you want. So in a worse way, and the phosphatases are the ones that can take those off. So I can reverse the action. Everything is reversible because that's the most energy efficient way of doing that. So. <clears throat> And we work on these, these phosphatase. And the one phosphatase we work on is called calcineurin. It's a serine threonine phosphatase, so it's specific to serine threonine. And this is kind of amazing. So calcineurin is 1% of our brain mass. Let's think about that, 1% of our brain mass. If you think of all of us who are sitting here, if you think of our brain mass, there's a couple of grams of calcineurin sitting around here. This is kind of, it's, if you think about that, it's kind of a fantastic number to, to think about that. How much of these proteins we have right now, and it helps us to think, it helps us to remember, it helps us to, to move things, it helps us all these type of things. It's driven because it can bind calcium, and that allows it to know when to function to do certain things. And by acting of other proteins, which we call substrates of this enzyme, it like communicates its action forward and allows us actually to do all these type of things, okay? So this has a plethora of function. It's important for the brain. It's really important. And, and we know, and, and others know too, that it has a critical function keeping uh, for Alzheimer's disease. That protein that forms this fibril in Alzheimer's disease, the tau proteins, uh, is, is hypophosphorylated because calcineurin doesn't work in the same way as it does in a, in a normal person. So another way of thinking about Alzheimer's. But it's most famous known for the way how it acts in the immune system. And our immune system is a crazy thing if you think about it. It's always on. All of us, we're working here, we're sitting here, we are relaxed here. Our immune system is not relaxed. It always scans for invaders. That's how it keeps us healthy. That's how it keeps us working. It's all over our body, every organ, everywhere. That's our immune system. It works on a constant basis. And that's how, you know, that's why we lived for 50 years before without the help of the drugs. Okay, because we have this fantastic system that we have here that can combat all these invaders from bacteria over uh, viruses over all other things that, that invade us. This is a great thing that we have that system, but it turns out it was pretty bad for one thing. If we wanted to replace an organ, that's impossible, okay? Because you put something that is not native to your body into your body. And the immune system recognizes it, it doesn't care if it's a bacteria or a new heart, and says like, get it out of me. That's not part of me. And that's why we could never get a transplant to work. The much bigger problem was once we figured out how to get a transplant to work, our entire immune system was so compromised that every patient died quite quickly of uh, infections. So the first patients that had got a heart implant the camera teams were all over in the 50s. Everybody was talking to him. He died within like, I think, 10 days or 14 days of infection because his immune system was so uh, overwhelmed that he couldn't handle all the immune stress that he had. He didn't reject his heart, but he couldn't help because the immune system was not good. So then the second patient was in isolation and lived for much, much longer. But that's not a way to live, too. If you, yes, you can live for long and you have a new heart, but you cannot talk to anybody anymore. It's not really what modern medicine should look like. And it's interesting. So, for most of the time, how were drugs actually found? Purely by accident. Okay, purely by accident. Most companies looked for natural compounds. Okay, so there's a lot of compounds that are laying around and that helps animals to survive helps actually other things to survive. And we looked, how are they working? Can we use them as a drug as well? Chinese medicine is famous for that, but we did nothing else. We went to the oceans, we went to every mountain, to went to everywhere to look for that. And that's still a source 
of medicine these days. So we should not, this is really designed by nature, if you want so, not a specific design, but it takes a long time. You never know if you will find something and trial and error is good, but trial and error is also, the error is more often uh, in, than the success. So uh, Sandoz, which is now Novartis, had this huge soil screening, okay? They looked for soil screen adherents and they tested simply if they have effects, okay, in certain basic setups. And they found something, they were looking for something that suppresses the immune system. However, they shouldn't kill the cells at the same time because then the immune system is still strong enough to actually survive. Well, that would be good for our heart patients. You, you, you slow down the immune system enough that you can get a new heart, but you don't kill the immune system that it can't react to anything else anymore. That's really what's necessary. And they found this compound, cyclosporin A. I mean, this is a peptide. We know that these are a couple of amino acids that are made up of this peptide. And they found that, they, they identified it in the 70s. They determined the structure, realized it's a peptide, how to make it. And they used it, and in, in, in 78, the first kidney and bone marrow transfer were gone. And they were actually only successful because of cyclosporin. Okay, this was first the immune system and it's published here. And in, 98, in 1983, this was FDA approved. Okay, so transplant were only possible from this time on, actually really in a, in a large scale. And there's a, it's a second compound, FK5-6, that was discovered one year after that and, uh, and, and about 10 years later approved. Okay, FK5 or 6. So if you get an operation these days, cyclosporin is still what's used. Okay, FK5 or 6 is the more potent drug. But if you use it on the operation table, you will have a hard time dosing it correctly so the patient doesn't die. Okay, because you can overdose the patients very quickly. This is a much weaker drug. That's what you use on the operating table. Later, you get to FK5 or 6. Those make about $3.5 billion every year. So it's a good uh, uh, dose for, for more than 25, 30 years. So that's a, a, a reasonable product uh, for no artists. So the rejection rate is quite low with those. And so, yeah, so one year survival rate is about 95. So that's now how we actually do transplantations. So how is that working? How are these drugs working? Well, we have the structures. We have the structures. So this is the protein calcineurin that I mentioned before. And we know that these drugs, cyclosporin A, are binding to calcineurin. So my phosphatase is the target because we know that it's critically important for managing the immune system. Okay, so these drugs are binding here. And this is what we call the active side. So this is where actually the action is happening. This is where the center of action of the protein is. And we know these structures for 20, 25, 30 years, and we had no idea how to, these drugs were working. This was approved 84. So 30, 40 years, we have no idea how the drugs are working, but they work, they function. Keep that in mind. And this is true for many drugs, actually. Um, so there's the active side. So common sense to slow down the rate of action would be that this thing should bind in here, block it up. That's how you do it. If the, the point of action, you want to block it up. That's how aspirin works. That's how the HIV inhibitor works. This is far away. So nobody understood how they're working. FK5 or 6 is exactly the same. Well, you can look from the top of it, and you can see now the shapes that these proteins have. Because of the shapes, these crevices, they look like sort of a moon surface, if you want so. And the moon surface that is that we use to dig in my organic molecules that are my drugs to find the counterpart that actually fills up those gaps. And that's why these molecules, these drugs are binding so deeply into it. So they do not bind to the active site. So nobody understands how that action was actually working. So what we did is we know that there's a virus out there. It's the African spine fever virus. It's, it's, it's mostly working on, 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 on pigs, okay? Uh, and not in humans. So that's good, but we know it's a potent inhibitor of calcineurin in those pigs. It is a crazy inhibitor because H238L can kill a, a pig farm of 10,000 animals in two days. That's how fast it spread. 
Okay, it's a huge problem in Africa and in Eastern Europe at one point. So this is really something where people got very a big attention. On it. And this is the protein of the virus that is in charge of that. So we identified where it's inhibiting it, where its action is coming from. Okay, so what we are doing as structural biologists, we say, let's look how that thing is working. And by looking means look at the tiny little proteins, the nanometer interactions that it has. And can we, when we see it, understand how it's working? That's the idea. So we can make those proteins in the lab. We can make that and we can crystallize these proteins and we can get the crystals. This is really experimental data. And I have to tell you something. People always ask me, it's like, well, you have like, my lab is quite big. I have like 25 people working there, a lot of professionals. So why do you need so much money? How much is like, well, this little crystal here took two people more than one and a half years to get those crystals. That's how much work it goes in there. And we we're working uh, quite long times. I can guarantee you that. So this is not easy to go get to that. And it's not it trivial to go from each of these steps here to get that information. But then once you have it, it actually is really beautiful because it's so quickly that you can understand things. And you're really, for that one day after the two years, we were really super happy and excited. And then it's over for another two years. No, it's not that bad. Uh, <laughs> it's not that bad. Otherwise, I think nobody would be in that business. But it's actually kind of a, a it's, it's really, science can be really a lot of fun, but you have to be uh, quite patient and persistence and be very careful and analyze your data. So again, this is the protein A230L that is binding to calcineurin. And what we immediately saw is, oh, Holy cow, that kills all the animals, but the active site is open. That's exactly like cyclosporin A and FK506. Okay, so this is when I can look in here. This is how it's binding here. And the thing that we realized is that we have, so this protein that kills 10,000 animals in two days does not block the activity of the enzyme. So how does this work? Well, it works in the following way that as we identified is there's certain part of these proteins that gets, must be recognized. This is important. We interact. This is a very dynamic environment. These proteins, proteins interact constantly. And these sites of interactions are equally important drug binding sites and sites that we use for drug design these days. And what we did here is we identified the two sites that are necessary and we're able to see that for all these proteins. And what it actually basically shows us is that a 230 l has these two sites that are known, the Pixit site and the LXVP site in these areas here. And if you remember how FK506 works or cyclosporin works, it works exactly the same way. FK506 or cyclosporin binds here that a 230 l protein binds exactly the same side here, okay? So what both of those things are doing, they disallow substrates to bind there. And substrates are the proteins that get tagged for communication. So I don't have, basically what this thing is doing is, they don't have to do anything with their activity here. Because if I disallow any communication to happen, I don't care if I'm active or not. Okay, so basically, if you make sure that this thing, this thing can talk as much as it wants, but if nobody listens, same effect. So, and the cool thing here is we found these pockets here. And I told you that cyclosporin here is the weaker drug. And you will see in two minutes why structure is so important. You look at this thing here. This binds in this very deep pocket here. It's, 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 it, there's multiple proteins that form the D crevice in here. And cyclosporin binds, yeah, not as good as the protein by itself. It doesn't reach to the bottom. Now I overlay that with FK506. FK506 is much deeper down there. And that is the simple reason. That little thing is the reason why FK506 is such a better drug. Okay, so now you know these are parts of a nanometer of a difference that make a bad drug or a drug more potent. That's why we need the accuracy of this investigation. And that's 
how we make drugs that we have from natural sources, we can make them much better because we have an idea. Well, one thing we can do is we can reach this pocket. If we reach this pocket, then we can connect it with this pocket here. We can connect it with another pocket, and that's rational design. That's how we design now our molecules that fit in each of those pockets here and allow us to make drugs better, more efficient, with less side products. And we can do that to a plethora of different types of enzymes and different diseases that we are interested in to work on. So they work exactly, these proteins work exactly like the immunosuppressants here. They block the side that is necessary for communication. And that means if I block the side of communication, I don't care if my enzyme is active or not, and I can forget about that. So this is really, so what we can do now is we can design new drugs that bind to this affinity here and put Novartis out of business. No, it's not that. <laughs> Hopefully not. And so this is a while ago, but this is the idea. So I hope, um, <clears throat> I, I, I hope I was able to tell you a little bit something, how we can use the ideas of looking at something, really understanding something by just simply looking at it. What are the techniques that we look at it? The variety of techniques, and I just showed you too. And I have, um, that's part of my laboratory that is working here. Uh, in, in the, so there's a number of grad students. I have a number, a number of, of senior uh, persons that work with me. They're all very talented. I'm really proud that they are in the laboratory and work with me. That my, all of my work is a collaboration with uh, uh, Rebecca Page, uh, who is a crystallography. Of, uh, <clears throat> Uh, this uh, uh, our funding agency. That's incredibly important where we get all of these people are paid by these agencies here. Okay, so they're all paid by these agencies by the American Diabetes Association. I'm, they have a grant that's part of the NASCAR here. That's why I show you that all the time here. So we have the National Institute of Health the, uh, and the different sub, uh, sub parts of the National Institute of Health. Some, inst uh, some companies that are interested in what we're doing and I, I really thank you that I was able to present that here. I thank you that you spent the time before uh, the holidays with me here. And I'm, I'm very happy to take any questions that you have. Uh, There's a question I'm front here and then. Yes, I have the mic. Sorry, it's just me. So I'm gonna get my cardio in today. Um, what is the difficulty in designing a drug that would take care of Alzheimer's and dementia? It's a very good question. What do we, because if it would be easy, people would have done it already. Uh, it's, uh, and <clears throat> the difficulties, there's actually two, these are two different questions. If you have to take it apart, because what we need to look at it what is the reason for the disease? So what is the what is going wrong in the disease state? Okay, if we have an enzyme, it's an enzyme that goes wrong. It's not fun functioning. The communication is bad. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is a functionality that a protein does not adapt its correct structure. Okay, so that's a very different concept. That protein, we these proteins usually we said we have the single chains. And what's happening, they fold into a, a folded structure that is the functional structure. Sometimes this folding process can go bad. And those are protein misfolding diseases, such as Alzheimer's, such as Parkinson's disease. And they, these misfolded proteins are the troublemakers. So it's much harder to design something against these misfolded proteins. In some real form, the only thing that you can design is something that would make them soluble again, make them go back into a linear chain and hope that they would fold correctly. Okay, that's in the laboratory, you can do that, but we can't do that in the brain. We can't insert denaturants in our brain uh, or heat up our brain to 80 degrees. Wouldn't work out. Uh, and so that's the problem. So what we have to do is we have to understand the true cause, why these proteins misfold, okay? And that's a very basic question because we're now in 2018 and we still don't understand why protein, how exactly the mechanism of protein folding. 
okay? It's a very complex mechanism because there's a lot of chemistry that happened. We know what the reason is, but I can't. So if you give me a linear chain or I, you tell me, can you design one of these proteins? No. We get better into it. We get more information because we have more examples, but we still cannot do it. We don't understand these rules completely, okay? That's something people work. If you find out these rules, I guarantee you win the Nobel Prize. No questions. Next year or two years after that. It's a, it's a, it's a clear-cut thing. Um, and people have worked for that for the last 50 years. It's a, it's an tree, it's, it's the most, it's a most critical question actually to understand. If we would understand the rules, we would probably know why they are misfolding. Okay. So what we know is why proteins misfold in this case for Alzheimer's is because they have certain things on them that are too many things on them. So tau is the protein for Alzheimer's misfolds because it's highly phosphorylated. So remember I told you about kinases and phosphatases that can put this phosphate unit on and serins and threonines. Well, if these proteins are working too fast or too slow, too many things are put on and too many things are sometimes not good or too many things are taken off. And that is a driving force why these proteins are often misfolding as well. So what, we are, what, what, what people are really trying to do is to understand Alzheimer's better is basically understanding how these misfolding steps happen as well as what are the driving forces that lead to the misfolding step. Because it might be easier when you understand how the driving forces is to inhibit the enzymes that are leading to that mislabeling than the cause by itself. And that's what's currently ongoing. And that's very hard work. It's very time-consuming work. And it's, uh, that's why a lot of companies have stopped working in it because it costs so much money and it's so time-consuming. And that's why it's so important that we, as a, we keep up uh, our work here at the universities because most of these questions at the end of the day, all of what you showed you for all medicines are coming out of universities and out of companies. Companies can commercialize them much better. They are much better equipped. But these ideas, how we get there, are all coming. And, and all of us have contributed to that. So why we're living from 50 years to 75 years, I always say, that's only your taxes. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever want to know why you should pay taxes, it's, for, it's from 50 years to 75 years, in the, the 100 years. That's a, it's more important than the roads or anything else. But that's really, uh, and, and I think that's a great thing that we have here with the National Institute of Health and other agencies that we have here. So, but, but that's the reason why we have that. And dementia is another issue is because there's a lot of parameters. It's, it's basically when we don't have to target define that makes it so hard. Or if multiple targets are involved in that, that's a much harder thing to do that. I want to thank you very much for your presentation this evening. It just found it extremely exciting, and I personally thank you. Uh, I have want to take two things that you said this evening uh, and repeat them and then ask two questions, if that's okay. Number one, you mentioned the fold of protein defines its function, correct? Correct, yeah. And that you also said there are about 20,000 proteins, maybe 25. And so my first question is, how many folds have been identified so far? Question a, number one. It's an incredible, good, 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 that's a very good question because the question is, the, do we have unlimited folds? You know, that's why uh, that was the longest part not known. What we know right now is that we have about two and a half thousand, three thousand folds, okay? okay? And these folds can vary, they can be parts of different chains and we can have communication on, on how they are arranged might be different but that's about we're in, in this range of folds that we have and uh it's it's unlikely that we get a, a much more folds so it's probably we have like about these categories okay the second question thank you was in your group the lab that you're working in the group of people you're working with how do you decide on which proteins to focus your attention uh, well, my laboratory is really well known for protein phosphatases. Um, that's what, uh, you know, about when I started my career as an independent scientist. So I worked, 
as a grad, a grad student, and I had the pleasure to work as a postdoc with actually a Nobel laureate out at, at Scripps Research. And then I started my own laboratory and I, I decided I, I liked the techniques that I learned over that time, but I started something completely different. And I started to work on uh, protein phosphatases. And a lot of people told me that's a very bad idea because uh, people were thinking they're housekeeping enzymes. Okay, because the kinases are all the specific things that happen. Here, okay, we have four, 500 of those, but we have four, only 40 phosphatases. So that's why everybody was thinking, yeah, they're housekeeping. Okay, the, all the important stuff comes from where we have a lot, but they were completely different. And over the last 15 years, we have uh, uh, really provided a lot of insights with many, many other groups in the US and in the world, how these enzymes are actually working. And now we, we are working towards the, our aim is to work towards the fact that we can also drag those uh, proteins that people thought for the last 50 years, they're undruggable and finding ways of doing that. And so what we are deciding right now, what we are working on is really depending on what we want to understand. These phosphatases have important role. We have a program that is in cancer for my uh, cell division, how it's working in cell division. What are these proteins doing? How are they creating the function? And when we understand the function, we can again do something with or against the function. Uh, and we have a program that's ongoing in diabetes research. That's something we're looking at and some programs that are ongoing in neuro neurobiology. And so we are looking at all these pro I, in this type of family that we're working on an export, how they're working uh, and how they are they are functioning in this. Uh, we have a, a small side project that we picked up because a, a, a clinician once came to us and, and talked to us and he's the uh, and he's the chair of the Department of Medicine of a large hospital, uh, not in the state of Arizona, but uh, in, in, and he told to me, I, I, we need to get these structures. And I said, yeah, that's not my expertise. And he's like, no, but I know you can do it. And I, I like you and you have to work on it. So he bombarded me so long with it that we said yes and no point. So we started to work on antibiotics, which is a really fantastic area to work actually right now also, because, um, and, and it's very good for, I think, academia to work on this for antibiotics, because antibiotics are, uh, we're, they're so important. I mean, we run out of them. We, if we don't do anything soon in 50 years, we don't have antibiotics that work anymore. And that might be an optimistic few 50 years because we, everything becomes so resistant. This bacteria becomes so resistant right now against our, because we have such a, a large overuse of antibiotics that have come to that. But we just, we, we understand how to work, but not really the details. So what we're doing right now is we are looking at those details. And, and you might think there's a lot of things that are understood but there's still so much not understood that we have here. And why is it so great for uh, academia to work on it is because the FDA approval process is much easier for, um, uh, for, for antibiotics than it is, for instance, for cancer drug. And I'll tell you why. It's because when you take an antibiotic, okay, you get it a prescription antibiotic, you take it for four days, three days, four days, five days. Okay, so side effects are really much more minimal than any other drug that we're taking because it kills the bacteria quickly. Day one, 90% of the bacteria dead. Day two, 100, day three and four, it's just to make sure that they don't come back, okay? So the side effects are very small and that's why the FDA approval is much, much more lenient because it, uh, you know, it's not a, a drug that we take for a year or two or three or four years or something longer that where the side effects can really have a, a dramatic effect. And it's really a great place for academia to work. The problem is that large pharma doesn't like to work on it because you only buy it for four days. Question? Um, several years ago, I worked with uh, a computer sharing, computer power sharing program called Rosetta. And it uh, tried to predict the 3D structure of proteins pretty much by a trial and error process using millions of computers. Did that ever go anywhere in actually predicting? 
Um, yeah, no, Rosetta is a famous program. David Baker, uh, you wash, uh, has, has done that program. I mean, he's an expert in these type of things and yes, it went somewhere. I mean, these programs become better and better because we have more and more data that we can experimental data that we can feed in it. And so they can learn from it and they become much, much better. And we can use all different type of inputs these days to make these programs better. Uh, and we can use this type of programs for, for instance, computational work, once we have the structure and we have the first type of ligand that we identified on it, bound to it, and we know how it's binding, then most people use computational ways to actually make, try to vary that molecule and see on computation experiment, what you can do to, to predict how it binds better, how it binds stronger, what you can change here. It's much, much faster to use computational ways here to find all the variations than to try out everything. Yes, I can make 10,000 compounds, but the grad students will tell me I'm crazy. And uh, so the computer helped me to convince the grad students much, much quicker to, to do that because if you do 50 or 10,000, there's a big difference. And that's where computers are indispensable. Uh, a priori predictions of these binding sites are still not working. And the simple reason is that this is all thermodynamics, basically. And we are very good in calculating one parameter of that equation, but the other parameter that has to do with motions and how we move and do everything, we're still horrible in predicting entropy. So that's why these computation programs have still a problem. If we solve that, if we have better parameterization of this part, we can move forward with this part too. Computation tools have become excellent over the last couple of years and they will become better over the next uh, 10, 20, 30 years. Everything with computational, literally only becomes better other than certain programs that we use. You did a good job at explaining. Nobody has questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Petty. <laughs> And I do apologize in advance. The flyers out front say January 7th. That is not the next Science Cafe. It is January 10th. Thank you for the, the gentleman who did bring it to my attention. I apologize. January 10th, Thursday, it's going to be the next one. I wish you all a very happy holidays, and we'll see you next month. <laughs>